Marcus Buckingham, one of the oldest researchers on resilience and a regular contributor for the Harvard Business Review once said, it's the unknown that scares us. Show us the truth about our situation and we'll reveal the true reservoir of our power. And that kind of sums up where we have all been as a collective, as leaders, as people, as individuals during the past six months. COVID has taught us one thing, we've all been under one umbrella, dealing with the unknown for an unknown period of time and going through a collective grief cycle. The grief cycle was introduced by Elizabeth Kobler-Ross, another um, famous psycho psychologist and researcher. Her work was basically on people grieving traumas, so dealing with divorces, loved ones, loss of loved ones, um, and so on. But what, what research has shown us as well is that going through any period of change where life before an event is not the same as life after the event causes a person to go through an emotional turmoil very similar to the emotional grief cycle that we go through when we face big trauma. So what that tells us is regardless of how big or small the event is, we still face, face an emotional roller coaster and it's going to go through anyway, it's going to pass anyway, we're going to face it anyway, and we always have one of many choices to um, rebel against it, to kind of hate it, to accept it, to embrace it, to go through it, or eventually to celebrate it. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to be talking, a very, I'm going to be talking about a very important competence called resilience. And resilience is a competence because it's like a muscle. There's no such thing as I either am resilient or I am not Resilience is something that you build over time and you build by experience. No matter how much you talk about it, it doesn't build your resilience muscle. Building your resilience muscle is exactly like building any muscle where you go to the gym. You go to the gym, you exercise the muscle, you do repeats over time, and the more repeats you do, and the more you expose yourself to exercise, the better your muscle becomes. And if you stop exercising for a while and slow down and relax, the muscle slacks and takes it a while to go back again. Another typical example is swimming. No matter how much we talk about swimming, it doesn't make us good swimmers. The only way you're going to become a good swimmer is by jumping, in, jumping into the water and trying out different techniques of swimming. Resilience is more or less the same. We learn resilience by practicing resilience, which is why research always shows that the most resilient people, if we do a resilience um, test on how resilient are you from one to 10, people who are more likely to be more resilient are actually those who have been exposed to traumatic events the most. So people in developing countries are more resilient than less developed countries, than, than more developed countries. People who have gone through personal traumas and grief and experienced post-traumatic growth are on a scale from one to 10, much more resilient than those who haven't. Okay, so in a sense, resilience is not how much stress we can take, but it's actually how much we can bounce back, recover, and learn from the different events that we face. So it's basically a, a series of three steps. Acknowledging the event that we're going through, learning from the event that we go through, and finally coming out from the event more powerful, stronger, more able to deal with events after that. What we're, we going, what we're going to be doing from now until the end of the talk is looking at different models of resilience, what builds resilience, what helps us become more resilient, and how we can actually induce resilience into our lives. And before I go there, let me just mention one last thing. There's no such thing as resting increases resilience. Rest is different from recovery. To increase your resilience, you actually need to recover from traumatic events. You actually need to induce um, an intentional practice that helps you overcome, learn from, and move forward. So resting, sleeping, giving yourself time is all good. It kind of gives you, um, in a way, time to rejuvenate, time to recuperate. But it doesn't really help you recover if you don't add to rest or sleep or uh, just giving time a few intentional activities, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And we will be relating this to the workplace because, and I, mean, I remember I traveled about two years ago to the States to study daring leadership 
um, under Dr. Brene Brown. And when I came back with this, daring leadership is essentially leadership that involves agility, um, vulnerability, um, dealing with the unknown, having faith, flowing, and resilience and grit. And when I came back, a lot of my peers and colleagues said, Rania, this is amazing, but it's not going to fly. Who on earth in corporates would buy daring, vulnerable leadership? And yes, when I first started out, it was very hard to sell to people that this is the essence and the core of true resilient leadership. But lo and behold, what COVID has taught all of us is, yes, it is. Because if you're not resilient, if you're not able to be vulnerable, if you're not able to flow and embrace and celebrate and deal with the unknown, then it doesn't really help. One of the models that best summarizes resilience practices is a model that's called Resilience Saves, where every letter of the word saves stands for one of the important practices. So let's go through saves and see what it teaches us. The S stands for social connections. You will not become more resilient by going it alone. Yes, you have to do it on your own, but you cannot be by yourself. So you need to build a social network of connections that will support you, help you, be your backup and help you move forward. And there are three essential parts to this. The first of it is actually to help someone else who needs your help. And that comes from altruism, that comes from being generous, that comes from showing a sense of gratitude, even for your difficult situations. So whenever you feel you're not resilient, whenever you feel down, try to help someone in the organization who is facing a difficult time as well. The good thing is, once you do that, it kind of helps you step out of your situation. So it's like you're taking a break, but an intentional break in a good direction. And then you can come back and take care of yourself. And when you come back, you'll actually have developed just a little bit more resilience to deal with and cope with whatever you are. So find someone who needs help, who you can you can help them by a kind word. You can help them by doing a task for them. You can help them by listening to them. You can help them by taking them out for a coffee. But find someone who needs help and help them. The second thing in social connections is to find a role model or a mentor. And the idea is not necessarily someone who's close to you, not necessarily someone who you speak to on a daily basis. I remember when I was working in a large corporate at the time and I was going through a very, very tough time and I needed to develop my resilience because my husband was traveling at the time, my children were very young um, and I was running in many different directions and I was facing a lot of stress at work and I felt really down and tired. And emotionally, I was stressed, upset, uh, angry, and almost borderline depressed, but not, not clinically depressed, but just down, not able to find the spark in my life. And the thing that helped me then was to actually look at a role model who had life a little bit more difficult than me. And, and it was a man, it was, it was a male, not a female, but what I loved about him is he never let anything stop him. So he'd come up, he'd come in every morning, um, one day he'd bring a coffee and sit with me in the office, the other day he'd go sit with someone else, other days he'd sit by himself, there was always music playing in his office, um, he always brought in fresh flowers. His attitude towards resilience was amazing and, and he was my kind of go-to inspiration in the morning. So I'd go into his office, pass by his office, or just call him up and talk to him just to kind of get a boost of positive energy by looking at him as a role model. Um, another friend I have who's a role model in resilience is actually someone who went through a trauma that caused him to have a physical handicap. And he went through a period in his life when he was totally down, totally depressed, had almost given up on life. But then he picked up the pieces slowly, one by one. And not only came back to become um, a fully functioning person again, but started giving talks about how his um, incident or accident had been the best thing that ever happened to him because it made him realize the true strengths that he had that he would never have capitalized on if he hadn't gone through it. And, and so whenever I feel down, I go to these social connections to kind of ask myself, what's the one message I can learn from them today that'll give me a boost, even if just for today. And the third thing in social connections is to develop what Dr. Brene Brown calls a square squat. 
Your square squad is your ba is basically your your champion team, your support team. They're not necessarily your closest friends, probably not your family, um, but just a couple of people who you know really care about you, will vouch for you, will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. So they'll give you tough love. They'll give you proper feedback. If you start victimizing, they'll tell you, Rania, you're victimizing, stop it. If you need to be heard, they'll listen to you. If you're happy, they'll truly be happy for you. And if you're down, they'll be there for you and sit there and ask you what you need rather than do what they think you feel you need. So develop a square squad, find a role model or mentor, and do something for someone else. That's the first S in saves. The second letter, which is A, is basically attitude. Develop a resilient attitude. And a resilient attitude comprises of three steps, again, and they're called the three Ps. The first one is permanence, knowing that nothing lasts forever. So high times don't last, low times don't last, good times don't last, bad times don't last. Reminding yourself of that and believing that and developing an attitude of not getting attached to anything helps you go through difficult times with more resilience. So I used to be someone who performs really, really well when I'm on a good day. But when I'm on a bad day, I suddenly totally drop everything. And one of the things I've learned when I started practicing resilience um, attitudes is reminding myself that for me to get here, I had to come down from a high. And so the next high will come and I will go up. But I just need to develop an attitude where I'm not focusing on the negative, but focusing on the fact that I know it's not going to last. And, and interestingly enough, once you accept the fact that it's not going to last, because a lot of times we feel like this is too much. I can't take this. This is awful. But if we just stay with it for one minute longer, we actually have that much more strength and that much more of a stress to go through it. So the first one is permanence, knowing that it's not forever. Another example of permanence at work could be something like, instead of telling myself, oh, my boss hates, hates my work, my boss is never satisfied with what I do, reminding myself that, okay, my boss didn't like this particular piece of work, but that doesn't mean my boss doesn't like my work, my boss just didn't like this particular piece of work. So it's not about the whole, it's just about this particular period in my life so it's not my life is off it's not my life is over it's not oh this is never going to end it's difficult today I'm having a bad period today I'm really down for now but I know it's going to be over and just knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel even if I can't see it acknowledging it makes it just a little bit better the second p is um, pervasiveness and basically pervasiveness means that we don't let setbacks and comebacks define who we are um, I'm gonna use the example of being a mom just because one of my intentions in life is to be a good mom I have a 19 year old son now and a 16 year old daughter and I remember as they were growing up um, one of my biggest intentions of, of kind of balancing and integrating work with life was to be a good mom and a role model to them and on days when things weren't going well, and particularly when my son was going through um, his teenage turmoil years of trying to discover his personality, create his own sense of belonging, I, his own sense of being, I remember there were days on end when we just couldn't connect, when we just weren't going, things weren't going well. And I remember feeling like I'm a terrible mom, I'm an awful mom, I'm just, I can't do this. I, 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 I don't know how to be a good mom. I don't know how to connect with him. And it made me feel like it was an awful facilitator and coach as well, because I'd wake up in the morning and go and talk to people about things that I felt like it was like I'm an imposter. If people see me as a mom, they'll know that I have no idea what I'm talking about. If I can't practice what I'm preaching, if I can't walk the talk, then who am I to talk to people about this? And I struggled with this for almost three years. And if I go back now, and if there's one lesson, I, if there's one thing I tell myself, if there's one lesson I'd remind myself of is, it doesn't last forever. So 
it's okay, be with it, it'll pass. And, and just because I haven't found the way yet of connecting with Adam or dealing with Adam or finding a way of getting through to Adam doesn't mean I'm a bad mom. There's a huge difference between I'm a bad mom, I'm a bad leader, I'm a bad employee, I'm, an, I'm a non-resilient person from I haven't yet found the way of doing this. So I'm not good at this. I haven't found the way of doing it yet. Um, I can't do it. I can't do it yet. What can I learn to do it? And, and the power of yet is another very, very um, impactful tool that was developed by a psychologist called Carol Dweck. She's the famous author of the book called Mindsets. It's an amazing book on how the power of our mindsets impacts our lives and impacts how we do things. And one of the important mindsets to have is, is the power of yet, knowing that I haven't done it yet, or I haven't found the perfect solution yet, or I haven't found the right answer yet, but I can find it. And a good example of this is Thomas Edison, the one who discovered the light bulb. Thomas Edison is known for having over 1,000 patents of light bulbs that never worked. And he's known for having done over 10,000 trials. Now, if I really, really reflect on that, how many times in my life didn't I know how to do something? Did I go through 10,000 trials of trying to make it work? If Thomas Edison, during those 10,000 trials and 1,000 patent um, uh, registrations had given up at any point in time, we may not have had the light bulb and electricity in a bulb the way we have it today. So, and I, I know we sometimes tell ourselves, I've tried everything, I've done it all. But when I challenge myself to count how many times I've really challenged myself and tried, it's probably maybe two or three. And it's been half-hearted, not even full-hearted. So again, pervasiveness and the power of yet. And the third P is personalization. It's not about me, it's about the incident. So um, my boss doesn't like my work. It's not about me, it's my work that he doesn't like. Or this project is not going as, as planned or as I would like it to work doesn't mean that I'm not good. It just means that things are not going as well as I want them to do. So, and, and, and the problem with personalization is that we always personalize what's not going well, but we don't personalize our achievements. We don't see them, we don't celebrate them, we don't acknowledge them. And we don't celebrate or acknowledge our strengths. So if you're going to personalize, Personalize the things that are going well, personalize your strengths, and personalize the things that you know you can build on rather than things you know are not going well. So the second A, which is basically attitude, consists of the three Ps which we just mentioned. And now we're going on to the V. V is basically values. One of the things that helps us become more resilient the most, one of the practices that helps us go through any difficult situation is to lean in to our values. And it's very tricky because it's one thing to know what your values are, to be able to name them, but it's a totally different story to live into your values. So an example of this, if integrity is a value for me, then I need to ask myself, what does integrity mean for me? And for me personally, integrity means choosing what is right and choosing what is kind over what is fun, fast, or easy. Knowing that clear is kind and unclear is unkind. That's integrity for me. So when I'm going through a difficult situation and I want to tell myself, okay, Rania, practice more integrity, then my question to myself is really, what's right over what's fun, fast, or easy? Maybe what's fun, fast, or easy is not to be vulnerable in the situation, but what's right is to lead into the situation, give it all I've got, knowing I might fail. If one of my values is service, then again, asking myself, what does service mean for me? And if service for me means being open to, um, being altruistic and giving people whatever they need, even if there's nothing in it for me, then my question to myself here is, Rania, how can you bring in more service into your life in this situation, not just for others, but for yourself? So if you were the one who was going to be taking the service from you, what do you need from yourself? And the essence here is to give myself, because I'm, I'm generally more good at being empathetic 
but difficult with myself with self-compassion. So I always try to bring in the value of service to remind myself of, of being compassionate with myself, giving myself empathy, giving myself kindness, giving myself a break from being difficult on myself when I'm not being able to pick up and move as fast as I would like to move. And this really showed up for me during COVID because there were many times when I was difficult on myself, when I was kind of pushing myself and telling myself, you should do better, you should be more resilient, you should know better, you know this stuff. But just because I know this stuff doesn't mean I can practice it without allowing myself to also lean into it. So again, know what your values are, know what practicing the values mean for you and then actually bringing those values into practice and the good thing about practicing your values is when you focus on your values and on bringing them more into life you focus less on the problem and focus more on it being a challenge and how are you going to bring your values to help you solve that challenge so so you move from a problem focus to a solution focused mentality or mindset towards whatever you're trying to be resilient with and finally, the last, um, or actually we, have, we still have two, E, which is emotional regulation or emotional agility. One of the most difficult types of resilience and agility is to be with difficult emotions. Anger, sadness, um, denial, sometimes hatred, um, feeling like you want to take revenge on someone or something. Um, requires a lot of emotional regulation and emotional agility and the best way to deal with emotions under one sentence is awareness equals recovery so the first thing we need to do is to have um, the strength and the patience to be with difficult emotions and a very very simple technique you can use is checking in checking in is basically kind of going into yourself and really asking yourself how are you feeling right now naming the emotion but making sure that the emotion is not something like i'm okay i'm upset upset is not an emotion okay so i'm upset how exactly am i feeling i'm feeling angry or i'm feeling challenged or I'm feeling triggered. Okay, so what exactly is triggering you? I'm feeling like there's nothing in my control. Or I'm feeling like things are happening to me rather than me being proactively taking charge of things. Okay, so what is this emotion telling you about yourself and what do you need? And one of the things I've learned is Emotions are very important messengers that bring us important information about ourselves. So, and emotions don't go away until they teach us what we need to learn about ourselves. Sometimes anger teaches us that we need to let go of certain needs. Sometimes sadness teaches us that we need to be less attached to certain things. Sometimes fear teaches us that we need to challenge ourselves and have the courage to move outside our comfort zones. But without those emotions, we wouldn't move forward. One of the very um, impactful movies that I've watched recently, and it's a cartoon, but it's a very good cartoon on emotions um, called um, Inside Out. And, and the whole idea of Inside Out is to tell us that being happy and on the cloud all the time is not good difficult emotions of sadness, anger, being upset, and, and, and there's so many emotions. In fact, there are more emotions um, in the dictionary that are negative than positive. And that tells us a lot about how the brain has a negativity bias. The idea is, if we always hate those emotions and resist them, what you resist persists. So one of the techniques as well is to say, okay, I don't want to be angry right now. What is it that I want? So don't focus on what you don't want, but focus on what you want. And then want what you want to want. So I don't want to be angry, I want to be at peace. Okay, so what will bring more peace right now as I'm angry? Maybe taking a deep breath, maybe walking away from the situation, maybe acknowledging that um, it's not going to work out right now. I just need to let go of it right now. Or maybe I need to ask myself, why am I so triggered? 
um, what is it about me that's being triggered? Because an another thing that we all know, I hope by now, is that everything that's triggering us has something to teach us about ourselves, not about the other person. So wave development resilience is, a, is, is developing ways of being with, embracing, acknowledging, being aware of, and then recovering from difficult emotions. And, and if, we, if we're going to start from one place, it's do not refuse or resist the emotion, acknowledge it, giving, give it room. And a lot of times when you give room to the emotion, it dissipates by itself. It's like a balloon. It keeps inflating, inflating, inflating until you kind of say, okay, stop. And if you leave it there for a while, it'll deflate by itself. It's almost the same. So I'm angry, I'm angry. Once you acknowledge that you're angry, you feel less angry. So acknowledge, being aware, acknowledging, and then kind of asking the emotion, what, is it, what does it want from you? What is, what is it coming to teach you? And then letting it go. A perfect way of dealing with it. And the last S stands for um, silliness. Don't take yourself so seriously. Don't make it so tough on yourself. Do something silly. Laugh for no reason. One of the reasons laughter yoga has become so famous over the past while, one of the reasons meditation and mindfulness is so useful for us is because what they teach us basically is to kind of take it easy on ourselves. We don't have to be so hard on ourselves. I'm not... Um, by nature someone who loves to go on on adrenaline rush activities but I've noticed that I develop a lot of resilience when I do them so I've done everything from parasailing to paragliding to bungee jumping to um, to sky to skydiving and the reason I do it is not for the adrenaline rush but just to remind myself not to take myself so seriously another practice that helps us with silliness watch small children at play or even better play with young children dance in the rain do something you would never do um, my daughter who's 16 right now is my biggest teacher not taking myself so seriously she's almost the exact opposite of me my go-to values are discipline uh, being proactive, being action-oriented. Um, my background is an engineer. Um, I was a project manager for a large number of years. So you can tell the kind of mindset that I have towards life. My daughter, on the other hand, is almost the exact opposite of me. And for a large number of years, she used to trigger me because I felt like I needed to help her adopt the values that I have because they're so important in life. Until I realized one day that she was sent to me as my biggest teacher in not taking life so seriously because if there's one lesson I would love to tell my 20 year old self now that it's almost 16 years later is stress less, enjoy it more, be with it more. It'll all pass anyway so you might as well celebrate the mess that is life. One of the famous quotes I love about resilience um, is from a movie called Moulin. Again, because I have children, I've watched every single Disney movie there was and every single cartoon movie there was for a certain period of time. And Moulin is one of those movies that really inspired me. And there's a, um, a moment in the movie uh, when the grandmother says to Moulin, a flower that blooms in adversity is the rarest and most beautiful of all. And I love that quote because for me, it capitalizes, it kind of captures the essence of true resilience. Bloom in adversity and become rare and beautiful just as you are. And as I finish this talk, I invite each of you to reflect on your own power in resilience and your own challenge in resilience. And what's one thing you would, may have learned from the talk today that you're going to actually start practicing starting from right now and develop a habit of increasing your resilience muscle day on day and, and experience on experience and, and difficult situation on difficult situation so that by the end of your leadership, you will have lived a story of leadership that is worth spreading, worth inspiring and worth learning from. Thank you.